Hi, in this series, I'll be going through linear algebra. And before we start, we will start with some motivation and what are the first few concrete examples. So the concrete examples that we can usually visualize is our, is the real line, the real plane, the real spaces, R3, R2. And then we extract out, we extend this to Rn, and then we see the properties that it had. And then we extend it to an abstract vector space, and then we'll carry on abstract linear algebra from then. But along the way, we'll add in some concrete examples for us to better understand certain things. So let's start with some preliminaries and motivation behind it and talk about matrices which helps us represent vectors. So what is a linear system is basically a system of linear equation is something of the following where you have linear equations over here so what does it mean to be linear is that the variable has is to the power of one or less so less is like 100 which is a constant one is like h and c so it's not h squared or c squared so it's basically linear algebra is like the study is the study of algebraic objects and the linear combination interaction be between them. So you have all these examples such as in physics where you want to balance the masses. So by the conservation of moments, your sum of moments on the left must equal to the sum of moments on the right. And you can get this system of linear equation. And in general, when we have a few, we say that this is a general system of m linear equation because there's m rows so there's m linear equations and then there are n unknowns so this is like the columns so you can see how this can be later translated to a matrix so a tuple that satisfies this set of equations will be called a solution to the system and if all the constants are zero then we say that the system is homogeneous. So some more examples is that 3x1 plus 2x2 is a linear combination of x1 and x2. But if we can see 3x squared plus 2x2 is not a linear combination of x1 and x2 because x1 is squared. Nor is 3x1 plus 2 sine x2. And when you want to solve it, we have already learned from our high school methods that we must simplify the, the equations and try to reduce the unknowns in the system until we get one e the equation that allows us to find the unknowns. And so the, solution, the cell solution will be a the triplets satisfying minus a minus a a where a runs through all the real numbers or all the numbers or all the elements in the field so we found the solutions by eliminating unknowns and we do so by multiplying it with scalars and adding to produce new equations to get rid of other unknowns and for a general system we can now do it we can create a linear combination of these equations and it will still be a linear combination and so the idea is that there the solutions in the original system will also be solutions in the new system after you do linear combinations and but the problem is it might not be happening that the equations in the new system are so you have the new system and this new system may not have the same solutions as the old system because let's say you have one row where it's zero equals to zero 
Then this could be have any solution. And so we say two systems are equivalent if they have the same if they are if they are linear combinations of each other. Formally we say that the equivalent linear systems have exactly the same solutions. And so a systematic method of producing systems with the same solution set will be known as the Gauss method. And the Gauss method states that if a linear system is changed by these three operations, then they will still have the same solution set. And so the first operation will be swapping the rows. The second one is to multiply the equation by a non-zero constant. And the third one is to multiply the an equation by a non-zero constant and adding it to another. So each of these three operations has a restriction. For example, multiplying a row by zero is not allowed because it will change the solution set. Because zero equals to zero, then you can produce any solution. And you cannot add a row to itself because then you get you can have the effect of adding minus one times a row to itself, and that's the same as multiplying by zero. And swapping with itself is redundant, so that's to make results easier, we don't need that. And the proof of why these operations work, you can check it itself because you are able to convert one system to the other with this operation and vice versa, you can convert this other system back to the original system using the same type of operation. For example, if you think about it, an equation, when you multiply a non-zero, for example, you multiply 2 to a equation. You just need to multiply by half to get back the original system. So, that's why you with these three operations, if you do them, you won't change the solution set. And what we'd like to take note is that every system of linear equation has either no solutions, one solution, or infinitely many. Why is that so? It's because if you have two solutions like u and v already, then u plus v will also be a solution and you can check that. So you can think of it like that. Some examples now to better understand what is Gauss method. For example, we now have the system with three equations and two unknowns. We can use Gauss method to reduce the equations and we result in the following as you can see now if you take this and this and use it to cancel off this you get zero equals to zero which is redundant and of course it's redundant because you have only two variables so you need at least two equations only so two equations will be able to solve the the system already so you show that y equals to one and x equals to minus two and Sometimes you can have an inconsistent system, meaning to say that there is no solution because you can arrive to a contradiction, such as 0 equals to 2. Some more basic results will be that we now notice that the unknowns play no parts and now we can rewrite the system to just show the numbers of the coefficients that we are playing with and the constants on the right hand side and this matrix is known as a matrix and this is called the matrix of the coefficients of the system and formally you can actually think of it as a function so you can read you can read more about the function properties over here but actually what we really care about is how we visualize the system so we won't talk about this right now but you can read it on your own. By the way, the textbook I am I'm using for this course is Hofmann's and Kuhn's Linear Algebra and Jim Hefferson Linear Algebra. So I take from both sides one place with more concrete examples while the other is very abstract. 
So then we say that the operations from our Gauss method are known as the elementary row operations. As what we do is we can multiply a row by a non-zero scalar, interchange two rows, and add one row to another. And here is how you see it in function notation. So those Gauss method operations are the elementary row operations. And why do we restrict ourselves to these three simple types? Well, we actually can see that what we have from the Gauss method applies again. And that each of these row operations, you can re you can redo it with the same type to get back A. In other words, the inverse function of the elementary row operation always exists and is of the same type. So the proof follows. For example, like I said in the Gauss method, an operation that multiply the R row with a non-zero scalar, you just need to redo it by multiplying that same row with a 1 over C. And you can check the same for 2 and 3. So, by this, we now can say that two matrices are row equivalent if they can be obtained by a finite sequence of elementary row operations. And it's easy to check that this row equivalence is also an equivalence relation. And the next thing to note is that if A and B are row equivalent, then when you solve the linear hom the homogeneous system on linear equation AX and BX equals to zero, you have the same solution. And really, if you, if you think about it from the Gauss method perspective, it's very obvious because you already know that you have the, the operations correspond to the Gauss method operation. And basically, two, if two matrix are row equivalent, that means they can be obtained by the same, by a finite sequence of elementary row operation, meaning you're just doing the Gauss method. So of course, the two systems have the same solution set. A more formal way to prove it is over here. So for you to read on your own. And so the next thing we would like to note is see a concrete example of how we reduce it. And so we shall now take this matrix over here and perform a series of row operations. And we get the following matrix over here. And this matrix now is able to solve easily so we just solve it and we get the following results and we translate it to having unknowns so then this shows us that the solution set will be the following and every solution will be of this form so in our example we see that when we perform the row operation and try to simplify the equations the rows we are trying to, we have um, we have, it well, it's not in random, and the motivation is to simplify the coefficient matrix to il, in a manner analogous to eliminating the unknowns. So what you're trying to really do is to get zeros in the different path. That's like eliminating the unknowns. And so we say a matrix is row reduced if the first non-zero entry in each non-zero row is 1. That is like corresponding to just the unknown x1. And then there's nothing here so you don't need to care about what, what scalar to divide later on. And then each column which contains the leading non-zero entry has all other zeros. So for example, you have like x1 then above will be zeros and below will also be zeros. One example of a row reduced matrix is of course the identity matrix. So you have all the ones and zeros elsewhere. And the example given are not row reduced because here you have a one but above is not all zeros. And for here, this row the leading coefficient is not one. And a theorem states that every matrix can be is row equivalent to some row reduced matrix. And really, it is just by 
if you just take the operation, you can really see how you roll reduce it because if you have a roll that, for example, has coefficients that are not 1, then you just need to multiply by half and you can get that 1. So really, you can, you, you can read the formal proof where how you play around with the operation to help you reduce it to a rule reduce matrix but I hope I've given you an intuition about it that's all for this video I hope you have enjoyed it please like share and subscribe and in the next video we'll talk more about linear system and its solution sets bye